This little guy right here? Oh yeah. This is going to be the subject of one of my longest and most detailed videos ever. We're going to talk a lot about the knife, but we're also going to talk a lot about the material, the mystery material that's being used. So make yourself a sandwich, settle in, we're going to be here a while. Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome in once again. Today we're going to be taking our time. I'm going to do something a little bit different than I normally do in the videos. I'm going to try to keep this intro fairly short because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about a very, very special knife. And then because of what makes the knife special, a very particular material being used for the blade, I want to take a very deep dive on that material. So what I don't want to do is do that in the middle of the overview and the review and my thoughts and then make it bloated in the middle of the video where you may just kind of tune out and go, okay, I don't care that much about the material. It sounds okay. I don't need to get so crazy about it. And then you might miss things that I might wrap up with toward the end. So I'm going to give you the specs and my thoughts and the review of the knife up front. And then we're going to segue over into a very deep dive into the Teravantium material being used for this blade. Now, I've looked all over YouTube. The few people that have reviewed Terrain 365 knives have getting a given you a little bit of information about dendritic cobalt. They really haven't done a deep dive. So I want to be the guy that comes out here and gives you all the information that you need. When it comes to choosing a knife, you know, when, when I do my videos here, it's not about just shouting specs at you. You can look up specs on a damn website. You can hear the specs on 35 other reviewers' videos because a lot of them just give you specs and then that's it. What I try to do is give you all the reasons why I love the item in front of me or I don't love the item in front of me. Not to influence you to buy it or not buy it, but so that you have all the information that you possibly need to make up your own mind. That way, if you've chosen that I want to buy this knife and you get it, you're probably less likely to have buyer's remorse. You're going to know what you've got. You're going to know what I felt when I held it, how I felt about the weight and the size and the balance and the blade grind and the edge and all that kind of good stuff. It gives you as much fuel as you can possibly have for ordering something online because, let's face it, it's a little sketchy ordering shit online. You'd like to be able to touch it and feel it and, and play with it before you can buy it. But with high-end knives, that's just not usually going to be the case. So Terrain 365, what is this brand? All right, so if you go back to um, uh, Tad Gear, right? Tad Gear, we all know Tad Gear. We love Tad Gear. Fantastic products. Uh, Patrick Ma was the founder of Tad Gear, along with his partners. And he designed what the knife that was called the Dauntless at the time. That's why you're looking at this going, why does this knife look so familiar? It reminds me of something. Um, there is some design DNA that Patrick has built into all the knives that he's ever designed. And it's some of those things are going to cross over and be shared. Um, when he left Tad Gear to form Prometheus Design Works, PDW, he carried over some of those designs into the new brand. But what he's done now is he's opened up another brand that he's partnered up with master knife maker Michael Venino, and he's created Terrain 365. Or I should, should say they have created Terrain 365. And the whole goal behind Terrain 365 is to make these exceptional knives in these great designs, but make them in a way where they're impervious to pretty much anything that you can throw at them. Go camping or hiking in the Pacific Northwest, get your ass lost for a week or so, and this knife will get through absolutely everything you need it to get through. The edge will last nearly forever. It cannot rust in any way. No part of this knife including the blade. Not a single part of this knife can be rusted in any way. Very, very, very cool shit. And again, that's the material we're going to discuss toward the end. You've got a knife that's lightweight, it's compact, yet it's still got a good full-size blade, quick, easy, fast, smooth deployment. Everything that you would want in one single knife is going to be right here. And that's why uh, I have long been a fan of, uh, of Patrick's work, his designs, the way that he thinks about how a knife should work, it all makes sense. They're not the flashiest. They're not the fanciest. They're not the prettiest. But they look smart. 
They feel good in the hand. No matter how you hold this knife, it fits your hand properly. Yes, there could be a lot more contouring and swoopy shit here and there, but it's going to change how you decide to hold that knife for whatever cutting you choose to do with it. This is going to adapt to everything that you need to do. The thickness and the shape of the blade, everything is designed to do everything instead of just be a single purpose knife. And the fact that it's impervious to weather conditions and moisture and rust and everything else just makes it that much better. So again, we're going to start off here with the, uh, the close-ups, the specs, my review, my thoughts on the knife. And then because I really feel that you need to know what this material really is capable of doing and why I think it's so revolutionary, we're going to spend the last third of the video just talking about dendritic cobalt. We're going to be talking about the Teravantium, the process and how this blade is made and what makes this so unique and why I'm excited to hopefully see this material make it into a lot more knives. So without any further ado, we're going to go right down to the tabletop review right now. We're going to talk about why this is one of my hands down all time of my lifetime favorite knives. And that's saying a shitload. <laughs> Seriously. Let's see why. Now let's get things started with a little bit of close-up action, talk about the specs, talk about what I think makes this knife so great, and then uh, toward the end we'll talk about the specifics of Teravantium. Now this is the packaging that you'll be receiving pretty much any Terrain 365 knife in. Nice, clean, professional packaging. Uh, nothing particularly crazy or special, but still a nice presentation for the investment that you've made. So you've got the outer white box. Reach in there and you pull out your zippered pouch. Nice, clean, zippered pouch. Nicely made. Inside, of course, will be the knife. We'll put that to the side. And then that's going to be it for the pouch. Now here, this is something uh, really, really interesting. And I haven't seen anybody do this before. And again, that's going to be because of this uh, very specific blade material that's being used here. This is a specific oil that's made for the lockup between the titanium and the teravantium. So since it's not steel, they don't have to use a steel lock bar insert. Um, the titanium and the teravantium are very, very close in hardness to the point where they're going to wear together instead of one wearing through the other. So their claim is that you may, that doesn't mean it will, but you may get a knife that has a little bit of lock stick. And if so, it's the first time I've ever been able to tell anybody, put a little bit of oil on your lock. Normally that causes lock stick. So they give you a little uh, container of that specially formulated oil to eliminate that lock stick. Now mine didn't have any lock stick, so I didn't have to worry about that. No big deal one way or the other. So this is the Invictus ATB in the OD Green G10. Now, for those of you that have watched me for enough years, you know I actually do not like OD Green at all. Never have, 
just been a thing with me for whatever reason. Uh, but I missed, I wanted the carbon fiber. I missed the carbon fiber by probably minutes. Uh, I was logged on to Terrain's website. They had the carbon fiber in stock. And I went, oh shit, awesome, let me get this. And I didn't even think about it till the next day. Carbon fiber was gone. I emailed Patrick. I'm like, dude, do you have any carbon fiber left? He's like, no. Um, so what they had left at the time was this OD green. But you know what? It's kind of growing on me. I actually don't mind it at all because I love the knife overall so much. I really don't give a shit about the color of the scale. Your overall length is eight and one, uh, actually 8.125 inches. The blade length is three and a half inches. The blade stock thickness, 150 thousandths. Now, could be a little bit thicker, but it really doesn't need to be. It works perfectly fine for any cutting test that you're going to have. Um, and it's just the right weight. It feels good opening and closing. So 150 thousandths is going to make it a little bit lighter weight in your pocket than something that's going to be, you know, uh, 165, 170 thousandths. Weight is only 4.5 ounces. It is extraordinarily lightweight, even though it feels robust and feels solid. There's nothing about this knife that feels cheap. There's nothing about this knife that feels like it's inferior in any way, even though the price is so low. Now, I know relative to what your income is, you might say, well... You know, $375, you're calling that a low price. Think about this. We spend a lot more money on knives that don't give us the benefits that this does. I mean, even look nowadays at the, the new price of the Sebenza 31s. I will always love Sebenzas, but you're going to spend over $450 to get yourself into a Sebenza. This at $375, I personally think is still a no-brainer. When these were first announced, and it was the, uh, I believe it was the full titanium, I thought they were going to be at least $150 to $200 more expensive. I was so shocked to see the price that I went, wow, I can't, I can't quite fathom how they're able to do that. And I'm still not entirely certain, but I'm really glad that they have. Now, a couple of features that I find very interesting about this, number one is going to be this backspacer. It's not just a backspacer. The backspacer actually doubles as an inline blade stop. So when the blade is open, it doesn't engage an internal stop. There's no external stop here at the bolster. It's actually engaging right here into the backspacer. So your backspacer is running from here and all the way around. Another interesting little uh, way of manufacturing. There may be a lot of other knives that do that. I've never personally owned one. I haven't seen any. Um, and I think this is part of the genius of, of, of Patrick coupling his business with Michael Vignino because you're going to get some more creative, out-of-the-box ways of making a knife. Uh, inside, you've got ceramic bearings, so you're going to get a very, very, very smooth action. Now, I have not oiled my knife at all. I don't lubricate bearing knives because you're not really supposed to. All you're doing at that point is introducing um, ways for the the action to get gummed up. And this is something that goes way, way back uh, to a conversation I had with R.J. Martin uh, probably six, seven years ago. And he's like, don't ever oil bearings. You don't need to. There's no lubrication required. You know, I mean, you're not really running enough stress at the pivot of a knife that you're worried about wearing anything down or anything like that. So lubrication isn't really needed. It can make it feel a bit slicker and smoother. But now that means when that lubrication breaks down, now you've got to do more maintenance. You're going to have to oil it again at some point in the future to keep that feeling that you're used to. The other thing is uh, any pocket lint, any dirt, any dust, any grime from carrying that knife is now going to get attracted to that lubricant and sit in the bearings. And that's going to make it feel gritty. Now that means you're actually going to have to do more maintenance to clean out the bearings. So I run mine dry. And this thing has been wonderfully smooth. And it's breaking in really fast too. When I first got it, it wasn't quite drop shutty. 
which again, that is not an indicator of quality in any way. It's just a way for someone here to demonstrate the smoothness of a knife when you can't touch it or feel it yourself. Uh, but it wasn't quite drop shutty. Now it is, and it's it's a wonderful smooth action. Feels great, sounds great. Um, so I have no need to put any lubrication in there whatsoever. So that goes along with the whole formula of making this knife completely rust proof. So your bearings and your detent are ceramic instead of steel. Now the whole idea between, uh, excuse me, behind Terrain 365, it's an intercompany collaboration with Prometheus Design Works. Since Patrick Ma owns both PDW and Terrain 365, um, when he co-founded it with Michael Venino, he really did something that I feel uh, was was quite smart by getting someone in there that understands his philosophy behind making knives and has also had a really wonderful success at making their own knives. Mike is is just, he's off the charts talented, um, thinks like an engineer, works like a knife maker, uh, and, and creates wonderful functional works of art. Beautiful knives, but also very, very, very functional in the forefront. So those two together, I think, meld very, very well. Um, so again, their goal is to make knives that can be used in all conditions. So the use of the dendritic cobalt allows for this blade to be completely non-ferrous. So that means it's absent of all iron content. There is no iron in that blade whatsoever. So that means it's impossible to rust or corrode it. They trademarked the name Teravantium uh, for this particular uh, material. And because of their manufacturing process, it's different than other companies that have used dendritic cobalt to the benefit of the edge holding capability. And again, I'm going to get into that a little bit later on. I don't want to get too lost in the weeds on that right now. I just kind of want to give you an idea of how this knife is made and why I love it so much first. One of the details that I really like is right here in the uh, lock bar. No matter how you engage this, your thumb just jumps straight into those grooves. It's got nice traction. It's got nice solid lockup. Not too early, but certainly not too late. The ergonomics on these knives are fantastic. And it sounds funny to say that because it is such a straight design. There's nothing uh, particularly crazy or fancy about it. But the way that it fits in your hand really is perfect. Yeah, the pocket clip's a little bit long. Uh, that's not really that big of a deal to me. Um, I don't care that it's a deep carry pocket clip. It doesn't serve any purpose. Deep carry pocket clips are just bullshit. But for those that really have to have a deep carry pocket clip, um, it's not the deepest carry, but it is pretty damn deep carry. Another thing that I like is that they have run a channel through the back spacer. And what that allows for is so that the blade can sit down as far into the frame as possible without the edge hitting the inside of the backspacer and damaging that edge. They've done a really good job of bringing that tip all the way down to the, uh, the very end of the frame without your finger catching it. And because you've got that full backspacer, there's no way for your finger to access that edge as well. You've got the hidden lanyard post right back here. So for those that don't like lanyards, and they don't want the look of the design uh, interrupted by a big hole back here. You've got your clean design all the way around, completely uninterrupted. But for those that may want to put a lanyard on there, you have that availability, and it's very, very easy to do. Um, you've got a little bit of jimping back here on the back spacer and a little bit of jimping on the crown spine. And while I love having the crown spine, it is much more comfortable. Um, the jimping is nearly useless. That's the one and only nitpick I have on this knife is the jimping doesn't do anything. It just feels like you're running your hand um, up and down a zipper. That's it. Um, some people, I think, might have an issue with the way that the tang of the blade comes back here to meet up against the back spacer. Because if you're trying to slow open it and your, your finger's right here, you could actually pinch your skin. 
doesn't affect me because I'm a flicker. I'm not really a slow opener. The way this detent is done is as soon as it breaks, it kind of wants to push the blade out anyway. So I'm always going to be a flicker. So that really doesn't affect me. Uh, but if you are a slow roller, uh, do keep that in mind that you want to hold the knife in a way that you don't really pinch your skin right there. But that's really about it. And that, that really is just a byproduct of having the tang meeting the backspacer as your blade stop and by having that section cut away. If that section wasn't cut away, it really wouldn't be an issue at all. I like the nice clean pivot on there. Nice and simple, nothing crazy. Um, the cabochons that are set into the thumb studs do glow in the dark. I'll give you a quick little zip, zip, zip on that. Turn off the lights. And yeah, they glow. And we, we all love shit that glows, right? Glowy stuff is cool. Not, you know, uh, the most practical thing in the world. You're probably never going to have to uh, rely on that. Because you do have to charge it up. But here's the thing. If you know, let's say you're leaving the tent, you're leaving the camp, uh, the, the campsite. Uh, I don't know. You're going to go take a shit in the woods. And uh, you know you're heading out there into the dark. And I don't know why you would use your knife at some point while you're out shitting in the woods. But let's just say that you're going to do two things at once. You're going to go take a shit in the woods. <laughs> and you're, you're going to go do something with your knife. Um, you can just very quickly uh, use your flashlight, charge up your thumb studs, throw it back in your pocket. And that way, if uh, while you're copping the squat, your knife were to slide out of the pocket, you can look down and you will see that little glowing cabochon and you will be able to locate the knife. That's, man, I, I'm, I'm reaching here, but that's about the only practical purpose uh, that I can think of for, for having a rechargeable glow-in-the-dark thumb stud. So just just give me that one, okay? Just give me that one. As far as the balance and the feel, it is, again, one of the most perfectly balanced knives uh, that I've ever owned. It feels fantastic in the hand. It really does complement anything that you could want to do. Any kind of cutting task that you've got, this is going to do it. Any which way you want to hold the knife, it fits well in your hand. Um, if you've got skinnier fingers than me, then you can choke up on that forward finger choil. Uh, me, I would end up probably cutting myself right there at the heel of the edge. But again, um, it's, it's something that I'm aware of, so I would be avoiding that. I really wouldn't have too much of a concern. But for those that may be wondering, yes, that is it. Um, I love the way the blade profile comes out. Um, I'm a big fan of this overall look, and I always have been, going back to the Dauntless. Uh, going to the original Invictus models that I've uh, have reviewed over the years, I'm a big fan of spear points. Matter of fact, one of the knives that uh, uh, one of the fixed blades that I make myself, um, I designed a, a spear point this year, and I've designed a spear point folder to come out next year. Um, it's just one of those extraordinarily useful blade shapes. Uh, it may not be the most aggressive or fancy or pretty, uh, but it, it certainly is a very, very useful blade shape. Um, and it gives you a very, very strong tip to work with as well. And that's very, very important for a knife that's going to get overall, uh, all around use. When we talk about your everyday carry needs, one of the biggest concerns for people is going to be size versus weight. A lot of times you have to give up one to get the other. You have to worry about, well, you know, I want a, I want a larger knife so that I don't feel that uh, it's not going to do anything that I want it to do. But then I'm carrying around this, uh, this monster in my pocket and it's going to be heavy and cumbersome or it's going to get in the way as I go to reach in my pocket for something. And then sometimes that trade-off is going to be, I really want something lightweight. So then you're going to end up with something smaller than what you actually want to have on you. And it may not always uh, perform every task that you ask of it. And I really think that the Invictus is a wonderful balance struck between the two. You've got a knife that feels full size in the hand, yet it's only a three and a half inch blade. You don't have any limitations to what this blade shape can do. I mean, it's not, you know, particularly a stabby knife, uh, but it will stab. It does have a tip. It does have a point, um, and, and it does open up nice and wide right here, so you can create a, a, a pretty sizable wound channel, I would think. You know, get in there and twist a little bit. 
you've got a great action that allows for fast deployment. You've got a very solid lockup. You've got a nice balance overall. So I think that as far as being an EDC knife, it's just about perfect. Uh, can it double as a tactical knife? Absolutely. You've got that blade shape. You've got that blade grind. Um, you've got the ergonomics that will certainly lend itself well to that, um, to be a, a second, third, fourth backup um, defensive weapon. So I think that it kind of covers everything very, very well. So for me uh, personally, I think that this is the kind of knife that everyone should have in their collection. This is a knife that will do anything. It will impress people that you hand it to. They'll feel the action. They go, wow, that is really fast, really smooth. It feels so nice. It glides. You've got premium materials like the titanium. Uh, nice work on the G10. All the decorative elements like the fullers, which, you know, they are not just decorative. They are, they are useful. You do get grip. Um, by having the fullers in there, that's why they're there. And then you have the fuller in the blade, which also looks very nice. And it is, again, as long and goofy as the pocket clip is, it works really, really well. So there's, there's just nothing about this knife for me, myself, that I would change. Yeah, maybe that little pinch point right there, but that's really about it. And that's a nitpick that doesn't really apply to me because that's not how I open my knife. So for me, this really is the all-around perfect knife. If it were a flipper, I'd probably be even happier. But really, when it comes down to a utilitarian EDC, I don't care that, it, that it's a flipper. Um, I am perfectly fine having a, thud stu a thumb stud opener. And you know what? A, there's a possibility I may even prefer it now that I think about it. Um, and it just feels somehow more utilitarian that way. Maybe I'm alone on that. Let me know your thoughts down below. Um, now let's talk about what makes this knife so special. I guess I should wrap up my thoughts on the knife. If you're on the fence, if you're looking at it going, well, it looks pretty cool. Um, I don't know if I could justify 375. Is it really worth doing it? I would tell you hop off the fence. Absolutely do it. Do not hesitate. Get one. Again, I go back to like that Sabenza frame of mind. It's one of those knives that I truly believe everyone needs to experience. Everyone needs to have in their collection. Um, they have another model that's uh, based off a of loveless shoot. That will be my next knife. No matter what, I, I don't care how long I have to wait for them to come back in stock. The design is absolutely unbelievably sexy, and it's everything this knife is. I, I am completely obsessed with that knife. I have to own that. It's not as classic as this is, so I would say if you were if you had to look across their entire lineup and choose one, it's gonna be the Invictus. Uh, and I like the ATB. I like having the bolster. They do make a version that's all G10 on one side, which I'm going to have to assume is uh, you know quite a bit lighter. But I like that handsome look of a bolstered knife. So that's my thoughts on the knife in general. If that's all you needed to hear, you can stop it here. But I want to carry on right now and talk about what Teravantium really is. So Teravantium is similar in concept to Stellite. And I've, I've uh, reviewed Stellite 6K knives in the past, both with Tom Mayo and with DDR. Um, and the whole idea behind them is is a material that cannot rust because it's not technically steel. But it can hold an edge for a very, 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 very long time. What's going on here with the dendritic cobalt and the way that uh, Terrain 365 is manufacturing this material is they're not taking this material and forging it. They're not pounding it into billets and then um, they're not rolling it. They're not surface grinding it in the traditional ways because what they don't want to do is they don't want to crush the dendritic crystal carbides that you that you would crush in traditional knife making and bladesmithing techniques. What you've got is a mixture of cobalt, chrome, nickel, tungsten, silicone, iron, and carbon. So all these things that are in here will allow it to perform similar to steel, but it's non-magnetic. Now, for most of us, that's not a big deal. You don't really care about a knife being magnetic or not. 
But let's say you are an outdoor adventure person and you are keeping it in close proximity to your compass. It's not going to interfere with your compass. Think about uh, maybe you're storing your, your knife in with your compass in your backpack or in your pocket or something like that. Um, again, I'm reaching there. I'm not an outdoorsy person. That's about the only thing that I can think of where being non-magnetic would be a major benefit. So anyway, the blades, as I mentioned, aren't made by traditional bladesmithing techniques. They're not forged. The blades are cast. Now, in other alloy applications, let's say like, uh, you know, building racing engines, we look at forged parts as being superior to cast, right? Because of the strength. But that's because they need a great deal of strength that's simply not required in a knife blade. So it's not really a negative for this application. When you deal with anything in this realm, um, you're always looking at a balance between hardness and toughness, right? So to get one higher in the spectrum, you lose on the other side. So if you want hardness, you've got to give up some toughness. Um, if you want toughness, you've got to give up some hardness. And this applies to gemstones. It applies to steels, everything. So for superior edge retention, you generally want hardness, right? But then you lose some of the toughness that can make the edge of that blade brittle. It can more easily chip. It can more easily crack. So to reduce chipping and cracking so that you can, you know, hack and chop and stuff like that better, um, you'll end up going in the other direction and losing a little bit of hardness. And that just means you'll have to resharpen your edge a little bit more often. But this isn't used as a hard use chopper. So the goal here is going to be extremely long cutting ability. Dendritic cobalt will cut with a better edge for significantly longer than any known super steels that you can think of. And that's because of the way that the edge is constructed. Now, I want you to think about, um, and you could do some research and just do a quick Google search and you'll find some images. If you Google, if you look at the edge of any high-end steel knife, right, get a microscopic view of that edge. And there's always going to be little micro serrations. You can look at the edge of a knife, even these, you know, mirror polished, wicked edge blade knives. And it looks like it's a completely smooth mirror like surface to the naked eye. But when you get under a microscope, you'll see that there's still a little bit of sawtoothiness to it. These little serrations. And we just simply call them micro serrations. That's how you cut shit. It's those, it's that saw like motion. When you cut through something, those little serrations are actually slicing through as you're moving through the material. That's how a knife cuts. What you've got here, I'm going to call the main component of this material a matrix. And that's moving away from, you know, knife making into more sciencey kind of shit. But this, this is a soft matrix of material that within that matrix holds these crystalline structures okay and the way that they're laid out allows for them to make this crisscross saw blade section if they used traditional knife making techniques by forging and grinding and everything else they would be crushing those crystals and mashing everything together and creating um, a suboptimal sawtooth edge surface if, if that makes any sense to you so the whole idea here is that all that exposed edge is going to be nothing but micro serrations of the carbide structure. The carbides are extraordinarily um, very, 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 very hard. The matrix of the material, and this is why they don't need to have a steel lock bar insert, is fairly soft, just like titanium. So, yes, this blade could be bent a lot more easily than, say, CPM-154CM or, or uh, S45VN or Magna Cut or anything like that. But it's not about the, the toughness of the blade. It's about the hardness of the edge. You can use this edge over and over and over and over without having to worry about resharpening it or stropping it for an unbelievably long time. Let's say your best hard use knife 
that you use all the time, that you know what you're using it for, you have specific tasks, and you know that routinely, once a month you have to strop it to maintain that edge, and once every six months you have to touch up the edge a little bit. Let's say once a year you have to resharpen it. You know this like clockwork. That is your favorite knife. You've had it for 15 years, and that's just the way it is. So that knife that you're stropping once a month and that you're resharpening once a year, if you use this knife for the exact same tasks with no other variants, it is highly likely that you'll be resharpening this every four years or every five years. It could last you four or five times longer on the edge retention just because of the material that's being used. Then you add on top of that the fact that you cannot rust it. As a matter of fact, Terrain 365 gives you a lifetime guarantee that no part of this knife can rust. All they tell you to do, if this is in a saltwater environment, you just want to rinse it off with with cool, clean water, cool, clear water, I should say, and that's it. And and that just keeps any mineral deposits from the saltwater from depositing in in the pivot area in the bearings. That's it. That's all you got to do. It's as simple as that. Now, because this matrix, this alloy, is softer than most any other stainless steels that you're going to find in a high-end knife, you know, while that means it's less tough, remember, it's a knife. It's not a pry bar. It's not a chisel. If you use it as intended, it's going to outlast pretty much anything that you own. If you really need a pry bar or a chisel, carry a little pry bar or a chisel. Don't use any knife for that. Don't use the tip of your knife as a fucking screwdriver. That's not what they're designed for. So if you're using this knife for what it's designed for, which is cutting shit, you're going to be extraordinarily happy with this. Um, They also, from what I understand, perform extremely well in that one medium that we all tend to cut often and we know that it's extremely abusive on blades, cardboard. Um, I've talked to a few people that have cut down cardboard with their, uh, their Teravantium blades and they're like, it, it's kind of crazy. It just seems like it never wants to dull. It just keeps performing the same way. Um, uh, now it's a little bit thick behind the edge. Uh, and because you do have, uh, this, this saber grind, it is a little bit of a short grind. Um, you know, if it was like a three quarter height grind, then you could have a different um, angle on the bevel. Uh, so it is a little bit thick. It, it, it is going to be a little harder to push through when you get to the, uh, the really thick materials. But again, it's, it's, it's like a laser. It just wants to cut and cut and cut and cut. So utilitarian purposes, this knife is going to do very, very well. Um, in a perfect world. Yeah. I'd love to see it go down a little bit thinner, uh, behind the edge, but Again, it's not really that big of a deal as long as the knife does what it's supposed to do. When I talked about it being uh, useful as a tactical knife, if you go back to um, reading Bob Terzola's book, you know, when he talks about how what makes a tactical knife a tactical knife, and I still consider this to be more of a utilitarian knife, just to put that out there, um, but it does fit the role of a tactical knife as per uh, Bob Terzola because of the way that this blade is actually shaped. Um, It does come up nice and thick back here. You've got a blade that's designed for cutting, for slicing, uh, also can be used for stabbing, and you've got that reinforced tip, so it's going to be tough. So when I say that this is a knife that does everything all the way around, this is what I'm talking about. It's not just about how cool the knife looks. There are so many great knives that... Um, that are out there. There's so many great knives that I've brought out to you here on my channel that you can just go, that's just a cool ass looking knife. It does do other things. Sure. That's great. But above all else, it's a cool design or it's cool materials or it's amazing grinds or whatever else. This is a knife that, you know, if you look at it in pictures, you might not, you know, it may not bowl you over. You may not go, wow, that's the most beautiful knife I've ever seen. There is a handsomeness to it. This is, this is like a Jeep. You know, there's a certain handsomeness to a Jeep Wrangler. It's not a beautiful vehicle. It's not, you know, it's not a friggin' Lamborghini or an Aston Martin, but there's a rugged coolness to it, right? And, and I think that's where this appeal is visually. But it's not about the visual appeal. It's about the fact 
that it just does everything that you want a high quality everyday carried knife to do. This is going to be one of those knives that's going to boot a lot of other knives out of your pocket. You're going to go to reach for your knife for the day. You're going to flip this and play with it and go, you know what? This is the one I want to carry today. I thought I wanted to carry that knife over there or that knife over there. But now that I put this in my hand, oh shit, I need to carry this. And it's got that fidget factor to it. It feels really great as the action goes back and forth. It's just, it's satisfying on so many damn levels. And I know it sounds like I'm gushing and, and perhaps I am. I am a big fan of Patrick Ma. I am a big fan of, of everything that he's done so far. Um, but it's because he's done it right. And I know he's gone through a number of different manufacturers over the years since he founded uh, PDW. And I don't really know why. I don't know if he ever had quality control issues or if it was time frame issues or cost. I have no idea why. But I really feel that where he has landed... You have the perfect balance of a fair price on a high quality, very, very, very well built knife where the mechanic, the design was worked out perfectly by Patrick, where the mechanics and engineering were perfected by Michael Venino and the manufacturing partner that they're using is absolutely perfecting the manufacturing. Oops, excuse me. Sorry. I didn't mean to uh, bump the camera there. They are perfecting everything about this knife. So when I say that this is one of my all-time lifetime favorite knife designs, that's what I'm talking about. It's a knife that is well thought out. It's well executed and leaves you where you don't desire anything from this knife. Would I love to see a, a collector's variant made someday, like a collector's grade? You know, maybe it was titanium bolster with you know a pearl scale or it's moku tie or something like that sure why not i think that would be pretty cool but again that's that would just serve to be a uh, a fun little thing it wouldn't there's no practical purpose to it i love the bead blasted finish that's on here again it has that utilitarian kind of look and feel to it uh based off of that finish Look at that. Just gorgeous. Anyway, I'm going to end it here because we are we're getting ready to hit 45 minutes here in a couple of seconds. Um, and I don't want to drag it on for too long. But I want to make sure that you understood that this is not a blade that's made in a traditional way, in a traditional material. Um, by casting it, that's one of the biggest differences, uh, by casting that blade instead of forging it, um, instead of grinding it down to its shape, instead of grinding it down with its bevels, Everything being cast, um, I, I had not heard of anything like that in a high-end knife previously. So I thought that was really interesting. The, the whole way that this concept comes together, I find to be very interesting. And if for nothing else, maybe you're not a hard-use cutter. Maybe you don't care that that edge will last you three, four, five times longer than any other edge and any other blade material that you own. <clears throat> maybe you don't care about any of that. Maybe you just want a conversation piece. Maybe you just want that knife that you can pull out and tell your buddy, yeah, man, that's not steel. That's not any kind of steel. There's no iron in there. It can't rust. It's anti-magnetic. It's anti-everything. And then have a conversation based off of owning something that is wildly different than whatever your buddy has in his pocket. There are so many reasons that we make the decision to buy particular knives. Sometimes it's aesthetic, sometimes it's for its usefulness, its overall design, its blade shape, its blade material, its uh, manufacturing process. This is one of those knives that I think if you go down any, any checklist, it's going to check off all the boxes. Nice, clean, handsome design, high-end materials, extreme high quality and workmanship, fit and finish, longevity of the cutting edge. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on to the point where you look at the knife and go, why did it take me so long to buy one of these? And that's exactly where I was. This brand's been around for a couple of years. The Invictus, this model within this brand has been around for a couple of years with Teravantium. And I've always been a little bit curious. 
And every time I would see them post up, I go, well, you know what? Maybe on that next drop, I'll do it. And I've never, ever, ever had the right timing. And I got very lucky this time. I'm very, very fortunate to have this now. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm, oh boy, I am getting that. I'm getting that other one. I don't care what I have to do. If I have to beat somebody over the head um, and and uh, and get one, I'm going to. Because now I want, again, I've got my, my perfect everyday version. Now I want a Teravantium that's a little bit fancier. And it, it harkens back to a an, an really incredible uh, design and designer as well. So there again, more than one reason for wanting to have a specific kind of knife. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up here, guys. If you have any questions whatsoever or feel I didn't cover anything uh, thoroughly enough when it comes to the dendritic cobalt, uh, how the saw teeth work, the, uh, the serrations of the carbide structure and the longevity, uh, please feel free to, uh, put a, a note down below. I'll do my best to answer it. You know, cause a lot of times, you know, I'm doing this on the fly. I'm not reading off a script. So a lot of times you'll, you'll kind of get talking and you may forget to make a point that you really wanted to make before you hit record. So, uh, one of those things could possibly happen, but if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to let me know. And, uh, with that, I'll see you guys on the next video.